All right, um, our final panel is our retirement panel. And I'm very excited about that. We have uh, Lynn Egan, who I think you've all met this evening, who's my Deputy Securities Commissioner, is gonna, gonna come up and introduce the panel. But I just wanna tell you that Lynn um, went to school in Carroll. She got her CPA degree there, Carroll College in Helena. <laughs> Um, got her CPA degree there. She worked for D.A. Davidson for, I don't know how many years as a, as a financial advisor. And then she was also at the Department of Revenue and now has been in this office as our, uh, for what, 12 years? Jesse would say 75. <laughs> <laughs> she's been there. She's been here for a while. And, she, and uh, she's, she's a powerhouse. So please uh, join me in welcoming Lynn Egan. Thank you, Monica. I've been with the State Auditor's Office, Commissioner of Securities and Insurance, for 22 years. Um, so I've been around and I've seen every scheme that uh, Jesse talked about over and over and over. I would like to introduce the dream team that we have today to talk about retirement, investing, and divesting. Uh, Joel Schumacher, Christy Buckley, and Stacy Bateson, come on down and take a seat. Uh, I'm Stacy Bateson, and I work um, here in town for Maddox CPA Group. I'm a shareholder there. I've been in public accounting for uh, about 15 years now, and I guess I grew up on a ranch in Rainsford, Montana, and was a cattle rancher to begin with, so there's my kid there. <laughs> All right, I'm Joel Schumacher. I think I'm... Me and JB here are the only two guys in the room, so. Um, all right, there's three of us now, it's really a competition. Um, I work for MSU Extension, I'm an economist, I teach a lot of financial education. Um, before I went back to grad school, I um, ran and implemented retirement plans for small companies for about 10 years um, in Denver. And uh, prior to that, for a while, I worked for Janus Mutual Funds in their um, retirement department. But uh, I'm a Montana native, um, didn't grow up on a cattle ranch, but there were a lot of cows around Malta when I grew up, so. Basically uh, <laughs> the same thing. Pretty close. Hi, everyone. My name is Christy Buckley. I'm a lawyer over at the Crowley Fleck Law Firm. I actually started um, similar time that Stacy started in accounting. I have a master's degree in accounting, and then I went to law school, and I have a master's of tax in accounting as well, so I have a couple different master's degrees. And I specialize in employee benefits advice, so I advise employers on their retirement plans. I design them. Um, we have a very bulked up retirement plan that we use to take advantage of every tax um, thing that we can take advantage of in the code. We work with um, compliance officers and CPAs to um, help figure out better designs for employers. Most of my clients, I would say, are employers and associations in their statewide or regional um, groups that have these plans. And then a tidbit about me that most people remember is that I started, I actually started reading the Internal Revenue Code when I was 13, and I'm pretty passionate about the Internal Revenue Code. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't ask for a geek. <laughs> 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 Um, can I see a show of hands of how many of you participate in an employer-sponsored retirement plan? A majority. So I, if I could ask, ask each of you to talk about uh, employer-sponsored retirement plans, where to get information, and how to make the best choice, and the different types that may be offered. Just feel free. Pass it down. And Okay, so from, from my perspective, what we're usually looking at with employer retirement plans is from, I'm usually looking at it from the employer's side and advising businesses um, about getting into the plan so that they can start, the employers um, can start funding retirement plans for themselves and helping their employees in the meantime. And, you know, we look at a variety of plans based on the size of the business that we're talking about and, um, the amount of money that is being generated by the business and is available to fund retirement plans. So there are a lot of considerations that go into the types of plans and um, you know the employers end up putting a lot of thought into how much they are willing to give to you, know, you as employees um, or you know if you're the business owner, you know how much money do you want to be giving to your employees 
um, for this retirement plan. Because it's something that a lot of people, when they first say, yeah, let's get a retirement plan, they don't consider um, the cash flow portion of this, just how much it's going to cost. And yes, it's going to save money, but is it going, you know, how much money do they really have to put out to do this? So we do a lot of work um, making sure that employers understand what the cash flow considerations are and what the tax savings are that will be generated by that. And then, you know, there's a lot of consideration too, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more, but about traditional versus Roth, because those are available both in IRAs and in a lot of 401k plans, and having those options available and different, there are other options and stuff that we'll discuss um, with those employers and what it is that they can obtain by using the different options and what benefits are available for their employees through that. All right. Um, I guess I want to highlight one of the things that I used to see a lot when I ran retirement plans, um, or even when you start your new job. So you get a new job, you walk in, and you go to the payroll office or the HR office, right? And they hand you a stack of paper that's about this big, right? And they say, bring this all back by Friday. <laughs> and you're looking at it, and you're like, well, I didn't really apply here so that I could fill out a stack of paperwork, right? So you find the pages that have signatures on them, right? You get those done, and you hand them back in on Friday. And probably in there was your retirement plan information. And you probably, you know, signed it about like you look at your tax return each year, right? Just make sure there's something there and you sign it. Maybe you look at the number above it and you're done. Um, there's a lot of really valuable information in that, but it's not what most of us are very passionate about reading through. And it's a lot of times kind of legalese type language, right? Um, so what I guess I'd recommend, I mean, certainly reading it's a great thing, but in reality, most of us aren't going to read that stuff or we're gonna read it very lightly. So ask questions. So when they establish a retirement plan, your employer, they have a legal obligation to tell you about the plan and answer your questions about it. So make sure you ask those questions because if you don't ask those questions, all they're gonna say is, you know, 47 had a signature on it and it's not signed, right? And if you've been at your company for a long time, how many people have went back into their HR office and asked if anything changed their retirement plan? Has anyone ever done that? Right? They might mail you something, you might get a new summary plan description, some of these things, right? And you get it, and it's almost as thick as this, and you throw it over off the side, right? So, um, so what I would guess my kind of key point with employer plans is ask your HR office, your payroll office. If they can't answer your questions, they may refer you to whoever's helping administer that plan, which might be a, a third-party administration firm. It might be a large company like Janus Mutual Funds or something, it might be a CPA firm as well, depending on how you're structured, or an attorney, uh, depending again on how you're structured. But if you don't ask the questions, if you're not the squeaky wheel, you know, you're not gonna find those things out. So if you're not an expert, which almost none of us are, ask questions until you understand it and make sure you're able to take advantage of the benefits that are in that plan. I think that's perfect advice. Um, what you'll get handed in that packet that he's talking about is, something called a summary plan description. And I think if I were a consumer looking at it from that angle, because I think my alignment to the employer perspective is pretty common to what Stacy is saying, um, I think I would advise a consumer to look for three critical pieces in the summary plan description. Um, one is, when do I get it? You know, are you, when do you become eligible? And a lot of times under plans that are sponsored by employers, um, there can be a one-year wait, there can be a two-year wait on profit sharing if it's designed appropriately. Um, sometimes there's an age requirement, you must be 18 years of age or you must be 21. Um, sometimes the year of service is defined according to the number of hours that you work. So number one, look for eligibility, see when you're entitled to get into the plan and um, what that start date might be. And then I think the, the second piece would be to just skim it to see what kinds of contributions are being paid into that plan. Um, there are actually about nine different flavors of contributions that can go into these kinds of plans. And um, you should just sort of get a sense for, are you making the contribution? Is your employer making the contribution? If you make your own contribution, can your employer make more contributions for you, like a matching contribution? Some of those elements to just understand What's going in for the funds? 
And then I think the third piece that I would really look at as a consumer, and this will really get to the point, I think we'll talk a little bit about more age, um, as, as you progress in age and how you view your retirement benefits over time, what are the distribution events? So there are a variety of distributable events out of plans, and those can include in-service distributions. You can actually take some distributions while you're still working in certain cases. Some things might be hardships. You, your plan might offer loans. Um, your plan might offer the ability for you um, to change into your own directed investment accounts. Some of these things that allow you to either take a distribution or roll your funds out and have more control over what your funds are. And, and so I think those would be the three pieces to look for in a, in a summary plan if I were a consumer. Thank you, and we had a question earlier. Somebody over here asked about um, an, an opt-out. Currently, most people have to opt into a retirement plan. And do you three think it would be a good idea if people were automatically enrolled at a young age and only had the opportunity to opt out? So this is kind of an interesting discussion. We, you know, the kind of the history when I was running retirement plans um, 15 years ago, uh, you know, the commonplace is if you don't sign up, you're not in. So you get that form, you don't bring it out that says I want to put 3% of my salary in. The default is that zero goes in, right? Um, we actually had a um, large employer that owned um, most of the Taco Bells, KFCs, and uh, Pizza Huts throughout about a five-state region. They had about 4,000 employees. And they followed the lead that McDonald's started in the 80s. They never on in the year, but something along that where if you don't return the forms back, you're putting 2% into the plan. Then if you want to stop, you have to come in and do that. So what happens in a lot of cases, and I think this is true, is those forms never come back in, whichever way your plan is designed. So if it's not an automatic enrollment, this forces people to enroll, or a lot of people by default will enroll just because they don't bring the forms back. So it kind of forces people to save. They have the opportunity to opt out, but if they didn't bring the first piece of paperwork in, chances of them bringing the second piece of paperwork in aren't very good either. Um, so personally, I think that's a great way to get people started. Um, one of the challenges with that too is if you don't bring the form back, you also probably don't make investment choices, so you're put into a very safe default investment, which again, I would really encourage you to take charge of your um, retirement as opposed to being defaulted into things. But in general, I think that's a good policy. Thank you, I thought it was a good question. Um, I agree, uh, but as for all of you, make sure, pay attention so that you know, uh, because one of the other things I've seen happen with the smaller, when people are investing like that and they end up with a small plan, a lot of plans will say that if you don't have, say, $5,000 in their plan, that when you leave that company, that your retirement plan has to go somewhere. It doesn't get to stay with that company. And you need to make an educated choice about where that's going to go, whether you take it with you to your next company or roll it into an IRA. Um, but you need to become aware. And so just make sure that you're you know, paying attention um, and know that if you know, maybe you did end up with one of those funds out there, figure out what to do with it now. Make sure you're investing it intelligently. Um, and it's really just a matter of you know, paying attention when you're signing up for things. Make sure you know what you're signing and know what you have because those are some good benefits that you can end up with. And if you just let them, you know, unfortunately, if you just roll them into an IRA, sometimes they can disappear through fees. So if you roll them into your next plan, um, at least the fees aren't going to eat up everything that you did pay in. So something to pay attention to. Make sure you're rolling it into another plan and knowing what's happening with it. Thank you. Okay, we talked about the employer-sponsored retirement plan, but the day of the, the defined benefit plan, uh, the pension is kind of going by the wayside. So let's talk about qualified plans. Let's talk about 401ks, IRAs, um, traditional and Roth, and what do you think would be best for somebody that doesn't have a pension like me? I'm fortunate to have such a thing. Uh, well, that's kind of a fascinating and tricky subject right now. There is this person named Natalie Choate who's really the authority on pension plans, and she just reached age 70 and a half this year. 
um, which is that magic age when you start having required minimum distributions for some of you who are aware of that magic date. And it's fascinating because she wrote, she's writing a book on it and she's, um, and she's talking about it in some articles. She actually took out a lot of IRAs. She, she has like nine IRAs. She has a couple <coughs> 401ks. She's kept all of her employer plans. Um, I think her message, or what I've gathered from her recent article on this, is that you have to do what, what works for you. And because she was so sophisticated, she had a different purpose for every IRA that she had. She had a different investment idea for each IRA. She would invest in different things for each retirement vehicle that she used. So be intentional about how you use your retirement <laughs> assets, because the day will come when you do have to take requ required distributions and you'll have to navigate all of those funds. Now, there are a lot of merger rules that allow you to merge things together, um, lots of rollover rules that allow you to simplify and, and net all of your assets together. And, and every choice, every person's choice will be different on how they want to manage their plans. Um, and so it, it's a there's a fascinating article if anybody's interested in, in reading that. And I think that's probably my main comment. There are lots of plans we can talk about, and they're all based on code section, internal revenue code section um, provisions. <laughs> so like 401k, 401a, 403bs if you're in a tax exempt or a governmental. Um, we also have some executive plans like 457bs, 457fs. Those all just got new regulations last week. Um, so we have a lot of different flavors. The only thing I would add to that is just, you know, a lot of times those choices are going to be made as to what type of plan is offered by your employer. Um, so, you know, rather than wishing you had a pension plan, focus on what the plan is and make the most of what it is that's being offered to you. Because chances are the decision on where you work probably wasn't made by what retirement plan they offer. So. Uh, you know, find the job you like and then make the most of the retirement plan that's offered to, the, to you as an employee. All right. What if a woman is 55 or older and hasn't saved much and hasn't worked a lot? What can they do to work to try to play some catch up towards their retirement? So if you are 55 or older, there are um, catch up contributions that can be done both with IRAs and usually with your with 401ks, um, most retirement plans offer a type of catch-up. So the best advice is to be try to use that catch-up. Of course, that means you're already hitting the maximum amount that you're trying to pay in. Um, you know, an IRA, the contribution is $5,500, um, but if you, you can put in an extra $1,000. So you're putting in the most you possibly can. So if you get up to 55 and you can put that in, try your hardest to do so. Um, with 401ks, you know, you can put in the extra $5,000, $6,000 down, yeah. So there's a lot of availability, but you have to be, um, Chris used a great word, intentional about it. And if you have that opportunity, try your best to use it like I say, that means that you're already maxing out your 401k, you're putting in that extra. And so it does take a, a big chunk out of your pay, but that's what you're gonna live on later because Social Security probably isn't going to pay for everything later on. You need to have that extra coming from your retirement funds um, because as she said, you know, pension plans are few and far between. Um, there's not many people that get to have those, so you're relying on Social Security and this retirement. Put away whatever you can. Um, learn what your plan says and how you can max it out. I'd just add one thing to that, and that's, um, you know, if you are able to start saving, and let's say you're putting away another three or four hundred dollars a month or whatever that is, you've also now taught yourself to live on less income now. So if you were making three thousand dollars a month take home, and now it's twenty six hundred because you're putting more into your plan, when you get ready to retire, you're going to be used to living on the 2600 not the 3000 You know, So you've already sort of made this adjustment that's going to help you transition if you think you're going to have lower income in retirement. So yes, you're saving, and that'll help provide income, but you're also getting yourself accustomed to living on a budget that might be more matching up with what the resources are during your retirement. 
I love all the comments that were just said. Um, I think my first plan of attack would be catch up contributions, just like Stacy said. You can do those at age 50 or over. Um, and exactly what Joel was talking about. I guess to sort of be on the cautionary side, because they're telling you all of the different ways that you can save and defer taxes and defer your income recognition. Um, I think people that are over age 55, at least in the state of Montana and the clients that I've worked with, tend to um, be prey to some predatory practices. So be defensive about how you manage your investments. And if somebody's approaching you with something that will cause you to leverage, I think you should think twice about it. We see things like reverse mortgages that are offered for people where they can take some equity out of their homes and they have a lot of dangerous tax and generational implications. You really have to go in with your eyes open and you absolutely need those funds before you take something like that. And the same can be true of um, certain annuity packages a lot of those, and if there are any financial advisors in the room, I'm sorry I'm not trying to attack you, but a lot of those are better for the person selling it to you more than it is for you and your interest in what you're looking for. So I think be defensive and sock it away. Great advice, Pallas. <laughs> okay, how can we pencil out our retirement costs and come up with a plan on how much we're going to need before we pull the trigger? <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to... to have the mic too long. So I brought an article with me. Um, it just came across my desk in um, the Journal of Financial Services Professionals, the May 2016 edition. If somebody wants this, they can um, tag me afterwards for a copy. Um, but I just found it. They did a, a couple different studies on, um, they call it a deeper look at retirement planning. That's the name of the article. And I found it fascinating. They say that in 2015, a 65-year-old man needs $68,000 in savings, and a 65-year-old woman needs 89000 if each has a goal of having at least 50% chance of having money to cover all of their health expenses, their fixed living, and their retirement. Um, and the figures here, they say, don't include long-term care costs. So I think health and medical costs are some of your bigger considerations. And journal of what? Journal of Financial Service Professionals. I can scan and email the copy she of it. She clearly her. has some interesting reading. <laughs> 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 Sounds like a great article, though, and that number surprises me. It's lower than what I would have thought. Me too. Yep. Journal of Financial Services. Yeah. 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 Professionals. You know, one of the things that I'd add, you know, in terms of estimating your expenses going forward. The, the best thing to know about your future expenses is what are your current expenses. So if you, if you don't do a monthly budget, like a lot of us don't, track where every dollar you have goes for a month. And you might be surprised. And um, you know, even if you're not gonna do it long term, try it as a one-time thing and then you can look and see, okay, which of these expenses, you know, maybe heating my house is not gonna change one bit. Maybe health insurance is gonna change because I'll lose my employer health care and I'll be purchasing a Medicare supplement or something like that. So understanding where you're at is a great step to try to figure out what's next. Yeah, I agree very much um, with that. And when you go through and look at where all of your money is going each month, um, take a step back too and think about some of the things that maybe only get paid um, once a year. If you're Property taxes, for example, are not getting paid through escrow, and you pay those twice a year. Um, make sure you think about those. A lot of insurance is paid once or twice a year, you know, depending on how you have it set up. Make sure you consider those things, and just kind of go through, you know, going through one month, and then consider some of those things that only happen a couple of times a year. Um, put put it all down on paper and look at that monthly budget see if there's things that you know you know you're not going to be traveling as much maybe or you're going to be traveling a lot more and you want to add that to your budget um, if you're the type of person who will be able to cook more in-house um, maybe your meals will go down you can make some adjustments for things like that that can help your budget but remember that that's what you're doing the other thing i want to emphasize is when you make a change um, I had a client who came in and they had been doing very well and they wanted to build a house 
here in Bozeman, um, and they were going to retire. Well, when we penciled out a budget for them, it turns out they couldn't actually afford to pay the mortgage on the house that they wanted to build um, and still live the lifestyle that they wanted to do. So what we decided based on doing that actual budget for retirement was they needed to build a significantly smaller house or choose a different area to live in. And ultimately they decided not to build the house that was their dream home and they chose to buy a much smaller one that cost them a little less than half of what they were originally intending. But then they could still live the lifestyle that they wanted to live. But they did not understand that until they went to the trouble of penciling out that budget. It's, it's really important at least to do it once and know where all that money goes and what you really need. Great advice. And I've been getting the hand back here, our time is dwindling, so let's talk about the white elephant. Social Security has been called the biggest decision you'll ever make. When do you pull the trigger? Can we each talk a little bit about the quirks of Social Security, the different triggers, and, and how you guide your clients? Okay, I've got the microphone, I'll start here. Um, so, 62 years old, 60. Six years old, 67 years old, 70 years old. Um, there's, you know, those are kind of the ages that get tossed around in the news and the ones that you need to play with. Theoretically, if you live to your average age, it doesn't matter if you take Social Security early or if you take it at your full retirement age. However, how many of us are going to live exactly to our average age? <laughs> and that age is. Um, like 82 to 84 years old, depending on male or female. So of course, Social Security doesn't get paid out whether you're male or female. Um, so there's kind of this number in there that is our average age. So it's a, not a fun conversation that I often have with clients because I have to say things like, well, are you sick? Is there something wrong? Do you have some medical conditions that could cause your life to be shorter? When did your parents die? Um, so if a client has parents that both of them live to be 90, I would say you need to probably wait, you know, unless you have some type of medical condition or they're financially unable. Um, if there's somebody who tells me that their parents passed away at 65 and 70, I'm gonna say you really need to take that probably now because Yes, it might not work out. You know, we don't have a crystal ball, but there's a chance that you're going to pass away early and you're better off taking it sooner. So there's a lot of considerations like that, but understand you know, if you take it at um, the earlier age when you're first able to sign up, that your benefits are significantly reduced. I think it's about 30% um, reduction in your benefits. If you wait until currently the full retirement age is 66, um, unless you were born 55 or in 1955 or later, and then it becomes 66 in two months, 66 in four months if you're born in 56, and moves up until you um, until the full retirement age becomes 67. Um, you're by taking it at that earlier age, you're taking like I say a big reduction. Um, if you are planning on waiting until 66 and considering waiting until you're 70, then you're looking at about an 8% for your increase in your um, social security distribution. So there's some monetary reasons to wait for that, but you've got to consider what your potential lifespan is. Like I say, that's a hard thing to look at for a lot of people. and. I hate telling people, you know, yeah, I think you should take it at 62 sometimes, <laughs> but it's something to something to think about. You know, I, I like that idea of, uh, and you know, the way I think about it too is, you know, this is just a math problem, right? We just have to figure out when we're going to die, and then it's a math problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty simple. Uh, but you know, a lot of the data is showing that a lot of people are claiming early. And a lot earlier than what the math problem would say, even though we're taking the best guess at how long we want to live. Um, you know, and I think some people that that dollar now versus waiting three years is hard to avoid. You know, that old psychology experiment where you know they put the kids in the room and there's a marshmallow on the you know the plate, 
And if they don't eat it, they get to have two when they're done, but they all eat it, right? And they only get one then instead of two. And I think that's, you know, so I think it's really tempting to take that cash stream. It's right there. All you have to do is take it. But I think you're probably better off taking an approach much more like you described here about thinking about what it is you want, what these possibilities are, what those risks are, and taking your best guess at what some of those things are. Um, and that probably will get you financially on sort of the math side of things to a better outcome, but I think that's pretty hard to do for a lot of folks. Quick question. Yeah, um, if you um, had an IRA as well, would you choose to uh, start taking from your IRA before collecting Social Security? How do you feel about that? You know, you know, one of the things here, we're talking about Social Security is one part of your larger financial plan. So I think that's great if you can visit with whoever's on your financial team, whether that's an advisor, a CPA, whoever, because all of these decisions impact the others. You know, maybe living on your save, maybe you've quit working, but you're going to live on outside savings for a year that lets you delay taking that, you, you know, is one option, you know, as opposed to maybe somebody that doesn't have that. So you, you need to look at the big picture. If you can have one advisor or, or some type of team that can work together, then you can bring in some of those different facts and make a better overall decision. Um, I agree that there needs to definitely be some thought put into it and make it intentional. There's some tax savings that can be had by doing things um, in a certain order, you know, depending on what your situation is. Um, so going and talking to your financial advisor and knowing what your balances are in all of the different retirement accounts that you have and knowing what your social security is, there's not a right answer you know, for all of you. It's gonna be individualized, but you need to um, know where all the possibilities are of getting those funds and then make a good decision based on that. So like I say, it's not, not a straightforward answer, but. You need a dream team, and I, I guess we're not going to have any more questions for the panel, but we're going to take audience questions for the next couple of minutes. You talked about a financial planner, and a financial planner is often good at helping in the accumulation phase, getting ready for retirement. But now there are people who are certified in retirement spending, the, the retire, you know, how you go about that. And so maybe you've worked with a financial planner your whole life, but if they, I mean, there's 10,000 baby boomers a day turning 65, so. And none of them want to hear that they have to work longer. <laughs> <laughs> but retirement, the people, there are people getting certified in that retirement spending. That's, that's a really good point, because I think to the other question in the audience, it's not just one math problem, it's iterations of math problems. So um, can I see a showing of hands of who has been on the Social Security Administration website? and you plan some of the numbers. So, that, so that's just one piece of the math problem, right? You can go in and log into your own account, see what your own earnings are, put in specs on what you think your expectation is, and see what that's going to pan out for a monthly payment to you. But if you continue to work, there's another calculation, and that's contributions in your retirement account with your employer if you have one. And then what your point is, another calculation to decide, well, is my IRA a traditional IRA or is it a Roth IRA? Because if it's traditional, maybe I want to leave that one in because I want to pay you know, tax on the earnings later. If it's Roth, I might be otherwise just supposed to take it out because I know I'm not paying any tax on the gain today. So there are a lot of math problems involved. Okay, here, I will pass this to, to the panel. If you're currently focused on paying down debt, how do you balance that with still contributing to retirement? So again, it turns out to be a math problem. Um, a lot of, I like people to look at interest rates and your retirement plan. Um, hopefully your retirement plan is earning 8%. Um, and, but I'd have to say not many of them are. <laughs> um, and look at what your debt percentage is. So if your retirement plan, I'm just going to use 8% as a nice happy number. Uh, if your retirement plan is earning 8% and your debt is, say, at 3.85%, 
the math works out better for you to be contributing to that retirement plan. Now on the flip side, if you've got credit card debt out there and it's coming in at 12%, um, that's, it's really an easy decision. You need to pay down that debt first. Um, so I like to look at interest rates because um, they make a huge difference and it's, it's definitely worth considering. So high interest rate is something that needs to get paid down fast. Low interest rates, you could be making more money by putting your money somewhere else other than paying it towards your debt. So, something to look at. Yeah, I'd add just one thing to that, and that's um, understanding your employer plan. Oftentimes, employers match your contributions. Mm -hmm. So, if you put in 3%, they'll put in 3%, that's 100% return the second it goes in. So, that's pretty tough to beat on in terms of your credit card, even at 18%. Um, so uh, don't forget that when you're calculating your interest rates, but it may be that if they stop matching at 3%, you don't put in any more than that. You just make sure you get your match, and then we go back to this exact problem that she was describing. If, if that debt's higher than what you think you're gonna make, pay down that debt first. I don't wanna belabor this question, but you can also, some, um, I would say about 60% of the plans that I work on offer participant loans out of the plan. So if there's a significant employer investment in the plan, you can take 50% of the vested interest or 50,000 out of your plan as a loan. And that may be a better loan term than what you have for your student loans. Those are a little bit more strict on the requirements because you have a five year pay down unless it's a mortgage or you show financial um, hardship or immediate undue um, financial harm. But um, that's one other way to sort of finance a loan in a different way. Okay, let's have one more, or two more questions. I was just wondering the difference between a profit sharing plan and a 401k plan, and which is more beneficial. <laughs> Do you want to? You probably know just as much as I do. So first of all, there's a whole lot of terms involved in this, right? Um, so 401A is a qualified plan. K is the term, is the code section that lets you put in your own money. So that's the deferral part. M is your matching contribution. 401A. M is, yeah. So, uh, and then there's other ones in terms of what they call profit sharing. All of them, sometimes they're called profit sharing plans. Sometimes they're called um, deferred compensation plans. Sometimes they're called qualified plans. These all are kind of blurry terms. There are legal definitions of ones, but what you generally want to know is how is that employer contributing to the plan? Sometimes it's a matching plan. So if I don't put any money in the company, it doesn't put any in on my behalf. Sometimes everybody that's employed gets a 2% contribution or 3 or 4 or 5. And a lot of times that's called a profit sharing contribution. And it's blanket to everyone who's eligible. You know, maybe you had to wait six months to be there. Maybe you had to be working on the last day of the plan here. But it's a blanket across the board, non-matching, but just a profit sharing. So. Don't get too caught up in the terminology, but see if you can understand you know, what it is they're actually offering you, and don't worry about what name they're calling them. Yeah, exactly right. Profit sharing is basically free money that your employer is doing without any strings attached. And that's not a matching contribution that you have to match. Your salary deferrals are coming out of your check. Now, the one thing that may be different is vesting. You are always 100% vested in your own salary contributions that you're paying out of your own paycheck. But on profit sharing, you usually see some kind of a vesting structure. So it's free money, but it's at the cost of longevity of employment. One final question. How do you folks feel about the 4% withdrawal? Is that realistic as you're planning and doing your own math? 4% a year, do you have your own spending policy and some years will be lower, some years will be higher? And then I find it very difficult to read about what percent tax, now that I will not be earning anything, what, is it 15% that they still take off the top? Thank you. So that 4% is really funny. I just read an article that there's not anything to support the 4% withdrawal. Um, in order to figure out what your withdrawal is, you need to, once again, do that budget and work with, um, you know, if you're good with math, you can figure it out in Excel, starting with your balances and figuring out some uh, future values of your money and working backwards with what your money will look like and how much of it you're going to spend down. 4% um, is <clears throat> not realistic in most situations. A lot of times it turns out to be if you're, you have to pull out less money than that in order for your money to last. 
But again, it's a big math problem and your earnings are going to highly impact that. Um, to speak to the tax situation, um, it very much depends on your overall situation. You know, if you're married, it's yours and your spouse's income that are combined to determine what your tax rate is going to be. Um, when you start putting Social Security into this factor or into the um, formula here, Social Security has some strange, strange effects. If your income is, if you're a single person, your income is under 20, roughly $25,000, your none of your Social Security is going to be taxed, and your other income will be taxed at 10 and 15 percent. If your income starts going up past that. And we get into the thirty thousand. The thirty thousand dollar range is this. It's this scary, scary range because one year, let's say you make twenty five thousand dollars, none of your social security gets taxed. The next year, you make thirty five thousand dollars. All of a sudden, some of your social security is getting taxed. And say the following year, you make forty thousand dollars. Eighty five percent of your social security gets taxed. And so you go. And it's not that big of a range. It could be that you took out some extra money out of your IRA to um, go to your grandchild's <coughs> wedding. And, you know, it was across the country, so you had to take out an extra five or $6,000 to do it. <coughs> that could change your tax situation substantially if you're in this $30,000 realm. And so when we're talking about taxes, always be aware if you're in that. Go talk to a tax advisor and find out because it's one of the most awful things that I ever have to do is people don't show up until, you know, March and they give me all their tax information and I tell them that, well, your Social Security got taxed and so you have a $3,000 tax bill this year. He said, well, last year I only, I only had to pay in $200, or I got a $3,000 refund last year. And it was because your Social Security is getting taxed. So that's always be aware if you're in the $30,000 realm, um, and it's a little bit higher, a little bit lower, depends on whether you're married or single, but it's kind of the $30,000 range, um, pay close attention to it. I think we're wrapping up. All right, so thank you very much to our final panel. Thank you so much. Hopefully we'll be able to stick around for, you know, a few minutes in case you want to come and ask questions. I just want to add one, one piece of advice, I think, that obviously when you're thinking about planning for the future, um, don't forget to take care of yourself, okay? <laughs> Tell a story about my husband. He's crazy. He's going to be 68 in September. All right. And I remember when we first got married, he told me that he says, I won't live past 45. And I said, what? Why, why am I marrying you then? <laughs> but, and his mother, you know, was convinced too that he would never live past 45. Well, <laughs> then the next thing you know, he was 55. And then he was, now he's 65. He's going to be 68. And to this day, he says to me, boy, if I'd have known I was going to live this long, I would have taken a lot better, better care of my body. <laughs> Uh, you all know that as you get older, your body starts to hurt more <laughs> and you start to have health issues. So make sure you're taking care of your health and your body, okay? Final thing, um, once again, make sure that uh, you, if you, when, when we send out these surveys, please give us your feedback because we really do value that. And also, if, in case you hadn't seen these and didn't know what they were over on the table, these little black sleeves. Um, <laughs> see? They're electronic sleeves for your credit cards, so that nobody can swipe this information off your card. So grab one, put your best credit card in there. Thank you again for coming out tonight, and uh, go.